Construction Champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum, and we're here for another amazing episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where I still say we're burning down the house so we can rebuild it. I know we had the conversation on the last episode, but it just literally hasn't aired yet, and I'm recording this one. So keep those comments coming in. What are we doing here? I think we're changing the mindset around the construction industry. Every day I'm seeing the change and I'm hearing the stories that are a trigger effect of something somebody says on this show. And what happens because of it, it blows my mind. And I'm super excited because we're going to do it today. We're going to have an amazing episode. Martin, I'm super excited to have you on the show today. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. Why don't you take a couple minutes, tell the construction champions out there a little bit about yourself. What excites you and what has you fired up here today? Well, I tell you, I have uh, been in business for 49 years, started eight companies over that time or reorganized. One of them was a reorganization. Uh, Two of them failed, went out of business. I lost a lot of money and lost people's money. Sold four of them and I'm still active daily in two of them. Uh, After I sold my last company uh, 12 years ago, I decided I didn't want to do that again. I'm older maybe than I sound, maybe not. But anyway, I thought, I don't want to go through all that again, you know, raising money and starting from scratch. I thought maybe I've learned something and maybe I can help other people. And uh, it may sound a little, uh, I don't know what the word is, but self-serving to say it, but I exist to help other people. Now, if I can make money helping other people, that's great. But the greatest satisfaction in the world is when you help somebody else and you, and you know that you did, they don't even have to know that, you know, that they did. And that's fulfilling and gratifying. So the way that I think I can help people is uh, based on my experience of 49 years in small business, having failures and successes and everything in between. Since I started coaching, I've worked directly with 500, well, actually over that, over 500 businesses, uh, some on a weekly basis, some on a seminar type basis, but it's taught me a lot and uh, I'm anxious to share that and I'm anxious to give it away on your podcast. <laughs> I love it. I love, we we give away a lot of knowledge yeah. on you. That's what this is all about is an exchange of knowledge to anybody that wants to listen, anybody wants right. to take action and get something done. So let's jump into it. I'm going to ask the million dollar question. And that is what makes a construction champion? Well, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> I've listened to your podcast. I've been on your podcast. Um, there are a lot of things. Okay. There's, you know, leadership and having a vision. There's being diligence or being honest purpose, focus, the ability to communicate and relate to people and engagement. There are a lot of things, but there's one thing that's closest to my heart because I see it as a shortcoming in many, many business businesses. And that is good accounting records, good books, and the ability to use them. Mm. And I bring that up in contracting. When we were guests on, or you were a guest on our podcast, I guess it was, you talked about the business you worked for uh, last with 25 million. Uh, I know companies around here that are in the 200 million. I know there are companies that are in the billion. Those guys understand their financials. Maybe not the frontline guys, but there are people, there are professionals in the organization who understand the financials, can see what's going on, see what changes need to be made. They can meet the requirements of a bonding company. And so they know that. Well, I was thinking, am I talking to those guys now? Maybe not on this podcast. I'm thinking of the hundreds of contractors I've worked with who do not know if they made a profit last month. They don't know if they made a profit last quarter. They don't know if they made a profit last year until they get their tax return and then they're surprised by it. Okay? You cannot thrive as a contractor without a basic understanding, without good books and a basic understanding of how to use them. Okay. Uh, You as a contractor or CEO or the president or the boss, you don't have to keep good books, but you need to make sure that you are, that you have good books 
And you need to understand how to use them to make good business decisions going forward. Other than that, you're just acting perhaps on gut instincts, which might serve you well sometimes. But if you're acting on gut instincts, a lot of times what you're doing is leaving yourself open to an accident. I accidentally did well on this job. I accidentally didn't do well on this job. Planning to survive and thrive by accident is not a plan. And the bookkeeping, financial statements, and the ability to use them is the bedrock foundation that everything else is built on. Okay. And just to give you an idea, and I hope you ask me questions here because <laughs> I feel like I preach, but I, I do, well, I do get away. kind of pre, I get kind of preachy on this stuff, but I like to throw some information out there. Why? I'm going to ask you this question. How much more do you have to sell to double your net profit? Ron, I'm asking you, just give me a number. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, it depends on what your net profit is. Well, how much more do you have to sell to double it? Well, uh, it depends on how efficient you are. Uh, but if you just well, you're giving me a lot terms, of depends. You, you you're just dodging my double, answer. I guess. There, there you go. I mean, that's what I hear most often. Double. I would disagree that I would say that's not true. Personally. It is. It is not true for the average company, which I can define how I define an average company as a company that does 35% gross profit margins and 7% to the bottom line. And there are 30.2 million businesses in the United States. And that's about it. 7%. So you sell a million, you make 70,000 before taxes. Say, so, well, that's not good. But for the average company, if they increase their sales 20%, they will double their net profit. Well, if you've been reluctant to do what it takes to double your net profit because it, in your mind, it takes double the effort. I can understand you're already tired. You're already working. Your wife or your husband's already mad at you. And the idea of working twice as hard isn't very attractive. If it were 20%, maybe you could do that, right? That's information you need to know for your business. How much more do you have to sell to double your net profit? Throw another one at you. Maybe 20% more sales is a too high a hill to climb. What would happen if you could get your gross profit margins up by 1%? I ask that question all the time. So like 35% gross profit margin, we get it to 36%. What would happen? It would increase the average company's net profit by 15%. That's a 15 to one ratio. I make these improvements to get 1% better what happens to my net profit? It goes up 15%. Well, how do I know that? I know that from looking at countless financial statements. There's a little bit, a lot to go on that without having this a Zoom call and showing a bunch of financial statements and pointing to this and that. But my point is, there are there's information in there like that. How do you get your gross profit margin up 1%? I'll ask that as a rhetorical question because we've only got 30 minutes here. Well, how about, Raise your prices 1%. Mm -hmm. That'll actually increase your margin more than that. But how about that? Well, I can't. I'm in a competitive environment. I can't raise my margins 1%. Well, how can I get 1% better? I, I don't know our listeners' particular business, but I can bet you they're wasting money and labor. AIS, right? The guys are out the door at 7, not 7.30. And they don't go to the convenience store and fill up with gas and go to the supply shop and start the job at nine. You start at seven and we have processing. All of a sudden, the labor cost on that job is down 5%, right? So 20% yeah. more sales to double, a 1% improvement equals 15% increase in net profit, right? A 1% improvement in gross margin. Uh, another stat I like to throw out, I just throw these out so people can understand the value Hopefully they understand the value of having good financial statements. But another thing is why do, why are people reluctant to raise their prices? Ron, I'm going to ask you that. I asked that hundreds of times. What's the answer I hear? People are afraid to be the price leader. They don't value what they do. And well, that's, that's a reason, but, and I think it's, this answer is contained in what you said. They're scared of losing customers. Mm -hmm. Well, wouldn't it be useful to know how many customers you could lose 
before it affected your profit if you had a price increase. And I've got tables, but and so I know this number, but if you have a 35% margin or gross profit margin and you raise your prices 10%, you can lose 22% of your business and make the same amount of money. And that's not usually what happens. You usually don't lose 10%. You might lose a few percent, but you make a bunch more money for less effort. Why, I ask people, do people discount their prices? It's the flip side of that, right? It's, well, they discount their prices to attract more customers. I say, wouldn't it be useful to know how many more customers you had to attract just to pay for your discount? And then stat on that is if you have a 35% margin and you discount your prices 20%, you have to do 133% more to stay the same. That means you have to do double plus a third more to make the same profit you made before the discount. Those people might be saying, well, I can't discount my bids 20%. Well, you're right. <laughs> you can't, but what, how does that happen? Oh man, I got to get to work. Oh man, we've got nothing coming down the pipeline. Oh man, I've got to uh, get something coming in to keep the guys busy and keep the crew together, which is a legit concern, right? But can we find some other way than discounting to entice people to take our bid? And I, I like to ask this in rooms full of contractor, did anybody ever win a bid in which they were not the low bidder? And of course, everybody raises their hand. It's not always about price. Price is a part of it, but it's not always about price. Um, I like... People to under well, one of the things I see very often, we're back to books and financial information, is people look at their books. They have somebody keeping something of books, and they look this month and they're up 75,000 or 100,000 in net profit. They go, woohoo, nice month, right? Depending on how big you are. The next month they look and they're down 75,000. I don't mean from 100 to 25, I mean they're negative 75. Go, what the hell, right? And then the next month they look, and they're up 35,000. And pretty soon they quit looking. Okay. That sort of thing is why I say people do not know a lot of people. I don't want to insult anybody. I'm just telling you what I've observed. A lot of people don't know where they made money last month because they see that kind of roller coaster profit and they don't know what's going on. Ask their bookkeeper, I don't know, I'm entering everything and they set it aside. Well, what happens, uh, especially in, with places that take deposits, advanced deposits. So pool builder or somebody like that. They take that deposit and they put it in income. Woohoo. I got a $30,000 deposit. I'm up $30,000. The next, but they haven't done any work or bought any material. Next month they go out and they pay their labor and they pay the gun. I got to shoot the pool and they buy some rebar and they spend 40,000 on that. Now they're down 10. They go, damn it. Then they get another deposit. Okay, well, that's just one pool, and a guy could kind of see that. What if you got 10 pools going on, all at different stages? And some sometimes the deposits are ahead of the of the expense. Sometimes the expense is ahead of the deposits. Anything they buy, they put it to cost of goods sold. In other words, they expense it immediately. And pretty soon they just, it's it's useless. Well, you can't know your margins. You can't do any of the things that we really don't have time to talk about about all of them here, but you can't do any of the things that you would do with good books that help you guide your decisions on the future. If the books are crap, it doesn't mean anybody's bad. They're just, there are ways people keep books that just aren't entirely correct. They're not crooked. I don't mean that. They're just not entirely correct. You have to match your income with the expense. We will go into all of that. But if you don't have good books, you can't come up with one of the most important numbers in business, in operations, and that's your gross profit margin. Um, I know that people, well, first of all, I've discovered a lot of people, including me at one time, don't really know the difference between a markup and a margin. A lot do, so I don't want to insult anybody. But people say, I've got a 40% margin. I got $100 worth of stuff. I had $40 to that, so I got a 40% margin. Well, no. Margins is what's left up. What's your share of the price? 40 is 28% of 140. So you got a 28% margin. Okay. So you don't know that you can't use margin 
to do a lot of the calculations that we do in business to help with decisions because your books weren't right and you don't know what your real margins are, right? And one of the most important things that you can do with margins is figure out your break even for your company. And break even, of course, I'm talking off a lot here. Am I generating any questions, Ron? No, I mean, hey, just keep you're you're okay. putting great Bre information out there. I mean, this is we got guys from zero to you know multi million dollar companies at this. Yeah, business. and this is all great information. Well, from a very easy to understand perspective. So my yeah, only I, comment so far is I can't agree more with the the one percent and getting out of the damn gas stations. Yeah. Like where hey, I have at at seven o'clock in the morning, smoking and joking at the gas station. And it's not just the crews. A lot of times it's the owners, it's the managers, it's the form, it's everybody involved. Hey, I, I have to comment on that. And then I want to get back to break even because I want people to hear that. But imagine it, you've got a job. I'm going to just throw something out here. You got a $10,000 job and you got $3,500 worth of gross profit in it. And you can do two of those a week. Okay. Let's say you get out of the gas station and you save six hours and you can do two and a half a week. That's $1,750 more to your bottom line to pay your overhead and finally accumulate its profit. Right. I have a, a former client and a, and a friend who does foundation repairs. And I don't know, he runs 12 trucks or something like that with four man crew on each one. It was really bugging him. And instead of blowing up and getting mad, he bought vending machines and put them in the shop. And he charges for it. I mean, he didn't make money on it, but if it costs a quarter, then he's going to charge you a quarter. And they do not go to the gas station. They've got a, a method of filling up trucks so you don't need to go get gas. You don't stop at the gas station, right? So that was, what a great solution. He bought vending machines. Ask the guys, what do you want in the vending machines? Mars bars, candy bars, health drinks, whatever you want. I'll put it in there, but you're not going to the gas station. And oh, by the way, the truck's leaving at seven or six. And I hope you're AIS, right? That your butt's in the seat. Anyway, it, there are things like that, that just instead of tolerating the waste or getting mad about the waste, there are ways that you can improve it might not be worth it. You say, oh, it's just 1%. But I just told you that in most companies, 1% increase in margins, 15% increase in net profit, right? So books will provide you that kind of incentive. Yeah, I mean, we <clears throat> saw, I mean, I had a, a huge change just in by outlining that we were going to start getting fuel on the way home from the job site. Yeah. Because what do people want to do? They want to get back to the shop and they want to go home they so stopping to get gas on the way it can be a lot quicker the shop is a lot quicker than getting gas tomorrow morning and we had a a, a performance incentive how we paid guys so going over this with our foreman so they understood how much money they were leaving on the table right when you have a couple two three guys at least an hour a day what does that that starts to add up huh. Well, it isn't even, I agree 100%, the cost of those guys. But the cost is more than their paycheck. The cost is the job they didn't do, right? And that brings me back to break even. I want to, that's a hugely important concept. And everybody needs to understand what break even sales is for their company. And break even, of course, I think people probably know this, but it's the amount you have to sell to exactly your profit is exactly zero, not a loss, not a, not a profit, 0, 0.0, right? I frequently ask people looking at, I won't even talk about how we come up with it because people go, what? But it's the amount you exactly have to sell. And here's why that's important. Because until you hit break even, when you have gross profit on a job, the difference between the sales price and the cost of labor and materials and so on, that's your gross profit. If it's 35 cents out of every dollar of sales, every one of those 35 cents has to go to pay your overhead. And it does not accumulate its profit until you have paid all your overhead. 
right? You don't, people go to work every day thinking, oh, I made a little money today. My landlord made a little money. My supplier made, guys made a little money. Oh, no, no, you're the business owner. You make zero until you hit break even and pass it. And here's why it's important. If you don't break even till the 28th of the month or the 29th of the month, you had better not go fishing on the 30th because that's your only opportunity to earn a profit. You earn margin, you earn revenue, but it all goes to overhead. And then it all resets, if you're doing it monthly, on the first of the next month. The rent, the salaries, the insurance policy, the utilities all reset and you start over again. And that's why it's so hugely important to break even earlier and do one extra job because the margin on that one extra job in this month contributes to profit. If it goes into the next month, it's just paying overhead. And if you never catch up to it, it's always just paying overhead, compressing things, getting them done faster, make you more money and give you the capacity to do more without increasing your costs. So I don't know. That's one of my passions is, is break even. And er everybody should know that for their business and know it properly, it properly explained. And when they do, all of a sudden they'll be going, oh my God. I mean, that's why it works that a 20% increase in sales doubles your net profit because up to that point, not quite all the way up to that point, but up to that point, you're just paying overhead. After you get overhead, that whole after you hit break even, that whole, the profit, the gross profit on that 20% goes entirely to the bottom line. And it's not hard, but the problem is people don't necessarily realize it. Once they realize it, going, oh my God. And the way to riches and the way to become 25 million as your company did to 250 million, it isn't that you got that $10 million job, biggest ever, which will probably kill you because you probably don't have even though you know how to do it, you don't have the cash to flow it and all that kind of stuff, cash flow to handle it. But that's not how people tremendously succeed. They get really good at 1%. And then they find another percent, right? And I talk to people, where can you find 3%? Well, you can start with credit cards, right? Power of 1% and you go take a credit card for the full cost of the remodel job. That's 3% of your margin right there. 3% of sales. So anyway, does that- uh, those, those numbers add up fast. And yeah. Every, everything you look at has a drastic fall to the bottom line. But if you're not looking at it, or if you don't understand it, this is exactly what you're talking about is why stuff gets out of control. Because right. it's so easy- to go a couple percent this way or a couple percent that way. And it sways everything so much bigger than a couple percent. I had a home builder client a uh, number of years ago and he had 10% gross profit margins. Okay. Most builders will, and right, they have a way they keep accounting. But my way of, of tracking margins is, a variable costs or costs that go up and down with sales, fixed costs or costs that you have every month, whether you sell anything or not, right? As mm -hmm. a general rule. Well, commissions on the sale of the property, the interest on the land, a lot of those things piled in and left him with a 10% gross profit margin. So talking to his guys at a meeting, and I said, if you have a 10%, in other words, of the sales dollar, there's 10 cents left for you after you pay the lumber and commissions and the, and the guys and subcontractors and all that, there's 10 cents left for you. How many thousands of dollars of a house do you have to sell to pay for one tank of gas driven around by a superintendent? Well, if that tank costs a hundred dollars, you have to sell a thousand dollars worth of house to buy that tank of gas. Whoa. What? I mean, I hope some of these stats people say, I don't know where that guy got it, but, <laughs> but that was, that was wild. Right. I mean, I, I think they are. I think I love that you bring the numbers, you bring some numbers in here and actually I'm a numbers guy. So like, I relate with that. That's that, that makes sense. 
And it's not just like do this or do that. Like here's some numbers and what exactly changing something 1% looks like. And right. I love that. Yeah. It gives you the incentive. And one other thing uh, that I like to talk about uh, that you get from good books, it's getting a little bad out there. There isn't anything about, about, we'll call this finance, right? Using books to make decisions. I call that finance, okay? Not an intimidating word, just some things you need to know. And and one of the things that you can do with uh, books is analyze, everybody's interested in cash flow, right? I mean, if you're not, I want to meet you, right? Because <laughs> you did something right a long time ago or somebody gave you a big payoff, but everybody's worried about cash. Well, Accounts receivable, payables, and inventory, right? Well, there are some metrics that you can use to see how much your how long it takes to collect your average receivable. And when you start playing with that, I have found companies hundreds of thousands of not I I pointed it out to them, right? I don't want to take credit for this, but hundreds of thousands of dollars of working capital, cash by improving their collection procedures, right? If you're a commercial contractor, you go, well, those SOBs aren't going to pay me and until such and such and then three-year retention. I say, that's fine. But did you get your bill in at the earliest possible time? In other words, did you wait a week before you got around to the invoicing and then it goes in and it missed this month's cycle? So instead of being 30 days, it's actually 60 days. Well, if you see those numbers, and you realize, are you kidding me? I've got an extra 300,000 tied up in receivables that I could get back that would relieve my cash pressure problem, or at least I could pay the bank back, quit paying the interest on it. Inventory had a, uh, a pretty good sized electrical contractor uh, and growing like a weed, became a client a number of years ago. Great guy, love this guy. <laughs> Anyway, one of the things I walked in, I like to see whether people have good books and what they can tell me and are they correct, things like that. And I said, well, uh, you don't have any inventory on your balance sheet, which is where you keep inventory, right? Mm -hmm. Most people just expense it, but it properly goes into inventory until you use it and then it matches up to the time you sold it. And he said, I don't have any inventory. I said, oh, okay. So we walked through the door and through another door and through another door and went into his 8,000 square foot shop, 20 foot ceilings, piled to the ceiling on shelves was inventory, right? I mean, light fixtures and conduit and pallets of wire and scrap wire or partial pallets and all the mechanical stuff that go, you know, uh, GS, uh, ground fault GFCIs, you know, which are $35 a piece. And there's a, two cases of them. I said, what's this? He goes, oh, that's all stuff we bought for jobs. I said, well, looks like inventory to me. He goes, well, we already expensed it. I go, so what we're saying is that your profit and loss showed, heck, we wound up with about $300,000 worth of, we counted it. Uh, and he sold a bunch before we counted it, so we didn't have to count. About $300,000 <laughs> worth of stuff sitting there. And one of the big problems was there's a case of GFCIs sitting over there but they're underneath some scrap wire. So they go buy another case because they didn't know it was there. Right. I mean, he's leaving hundreds of thousands on the table. And yes, he used a lot of that inventory, but they also drove over a lot of it with the forklift, right. Mm -hmm. Or scrapped out fixtures that people didn't want. So you can tell I'm pretty passionate about this stuff there. We leave so much money on the table. And I think the main reason is we're reluctant because we don't realize little things have this huge disproportionate positive effect. Yeah. Inventory can get out of control really, really quickly. Yeah. If you don't yep. just zone in on it, that that's its whole, that's a whole animal. <laughs> it's so, uh, it is, uh, it's it inventory is. control, man, but it's been absolutely fantastic having you on the show today. Thanks man. Uh, for all the construction champions out there. If they wanted to connect with you, follow with, follow you, reach out to you. Where's the best places for them to do that? Well, to follow uh, our podcast, the cash flow contractor that you can get anywhere. And the only thing is cash flow is one word in the name of our uh, podcast. Uh, 
my website is www.annealbc.com and that's A-N-N-E-A-L-B-C.com. And my email is martin at annealbc.com. And anybody likes to talk about this stuff, there's no obligation. If you're passionate about it, I'm passionate about it. If I can help you in any way, I would love to. I also, I guess, need to plug my book. I Absolutely. wrote a book about this, this subject, and it's called The Profit Problem. They say I make money, so why don't I have any? And it's written in general to business, but you can tell my passion is contractors because there are 40 stories in there, uh, 44, I think. And I show you why books are important, what financial statements mean. I explain them without using numbers or math and then how to make, how to use them to make decisions to improve your profitability. And uh, you can get that, the profit problem. They say I make money. So why don't I have any, you can get it at Amazon, any place you buy books. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for being on the show today. Man, I appreciate you. You let me talk to the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're going for Hope, the word. We're trying to get Hopefully it out. one person heard something and goes out there and does it and goes, oh, my God. And if I could find out that I changed somebody's life or not I, but I helped, that that makes uh, that serves my my whole why. I'm sure we got one person listening or the great thing about podcasts is that this lives on in perpetuity years yeah. from now, unless they delete the internet, this right, this conversation might fix somebody's business. You never know, yeah, but I hope so. Uh, all right. Construction champions. That's another great episode where we really dove into the basics of understanding your numbers from a real layman's term. Like just here's what the numbers mean. This is what moves the ball. This is what does it. So, I mean, I highly recommend, as I say a lot on here, is go back and re-listen to the episode because there's a lot of power in the stuff that Martin was talking about. And maybe go pick his book up. get a, Read it. Understand your numbers. I, I've said on here many times that one of the best hires you can make is a controller or a CFO. Like hire somebody that understands the money and how it should move better than you because chances are if you're like me it's not something that you understand the best but you do understand that you need to have somebody that really does understand it handling it so construction champions make sure you go out there you join our free facebook group our free mastermind facebook group where we're connecting guests listeners everybody to your other in one place where we can have a conversation about being a champion in construction. And then make sure you go check out constructionchampionspodcast.com. Take a look at our sponsors. They help keep this show rocking and rolling so we can bring you amazing content twice a week. So construction champions, go be the champion you were meant to be.